If you live outside of the United Kingdom like I do, and even then if you're not transgender, you might be surprised to learn that last week a major legal court case was decided in the UK surrounding one Maya Forstutter, who has been a very controversial figure for the trans community. Many of you may remember Maya as being the center of one Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling's tweets a little over a year ago, where J.K. Rowling made a big controversy when she revealed her anti-transgender views on Twitter, surprisingly making her discussion about how bathrooms worked in Hogwarts pre-plumbing only her second most disgusting revelation that year. But last week, Maya Forstarter won a court battle that has many transgender people both in the UK and around the world concerned, rightfully so, as it might signal an even more concerning threat to the trans community, especially to the trans community in the UK. But there's also been a lot of fear-mongering and misinformation about this case, so I just wanted to take today's video to quickly go over the case, why it's important, why it's not that much of a loss as people think it is for the trans community, but why, at the same time, it's also an important potential warning sign for new attacks on the trans community, and why trans folks, even those outside of the UK, should be concerned about this ruling. Now, as I said before, many of you may have at least heard of Maya Forstarter due to her being the center of a tweet by Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling last year in a tweet where she who must not be platformed said she hashtag stands with Maya. Gotta love our hashtag culture. But the reason that Dolores Umbridge in real life said that she was standing with Maya was because Forstarter had been working under contract with the Center for Global Development in the United Kingdom. But her contract was failed to be renewed after several of her colleagues complained about her anti-transgender tweets and Slack messages. You see, Maya, on both Twitter and in her workplace Slack, had been constantly vocal about her gender-critical views. Now, I've done a whole video on gender-critical views, aka what some people know as TERF views, where I tried to break down their viewpoints in as good a faith a way as I can, but also discussed why they're so harmful to the transgender community, because they deeply, deeply are. But to simplify for this video, gender-critical folks are a deeply concerning and vocal movement in mainly the United Kingdom and the United States that believe that transgender folks are delusional, that transness today is just a result of pop culture, despite trans and gender non-conforming folks having existed for quite literally the entirety of human history, and gender-critical folks also say that trans women in specific are just men trying to co-opt women's spaces and generally are predators trying to attack women. Now obviously this is incredibly inaccurate and incredibly transphobic, but again I've gone into a whole video breaking down where that ideology comes from and why it's harmful. Now, I wanted to give you context for these gender critical views because they're very important for the discussion at hand, but let's get back to the actual court case that is being talked about today. You see, after her contract wasn't renewed, Maya went to court to argue that she had been discriminated against for her gender critical views. But in 2019, an employment tribunal judgment stated that Maya had not been discriminated against for her views because, as the judgment stated, her views were not a protected belief, as they were, quote, not worthy of respect in a democratic society. That's literally what the words of the judgment stated, that her views were not worthy of respect in a democratic society. And by the way, it was this court case lost by Maya that prompted J.K. Rowling's Stand With Maya tweet. However, because of J.K. Rowling's tweets, Maya got new attention given to her case, which led to her getting greater support from the gender-critical community. So Maya continued her court battle, arguing that her gender-critical beliefs were a protected philosophical belief under the protected characteristic of religion or belief in the Equality Act of 2010 in the United Kingdom. And sadly, this is what the court ruling last week eventually decided was true, that Maya's gender-critical views did constitute a protected viewpoint. So that's the main point of what we're discussing here. And obviously, the fact that gender-critical viewpoints have been found to be a protected belief is deeply concerning to many transgender people. As I said before, gender-critical viewpoints are the foundation of a deeply transphobic and dogmatically politically active hate group, and is deeply hurtful on both a political and personal level to trans people. It might seem understandable to many of you, if you're not trans, that the idea of sex is immutable is just an argument that is, you know, scientifically sound, but as trans journalist Gemma Stone stated, quote, that belief doesn't exist in a vacuum and exists entirely to undermine transgender people's human rights. There is no other time people say the phrase sex is immutable other than to argue transgender people don't exist or otherwise should be treated badly. 
However, even beyond the ideology of these groups, what this basically works out to is that many gender critical folks who hold these views use this rhetoric that's veiled in the language of feminism to dogmatically attack and harass transgender folks and oppose transgender rights, and have actively campaigned for anti-transgender legislation against trans people in sports, taking away transgender affirming care for children in both the US and the UK, and trying to tear down and oppose the already very limited legal protections for transgender folks against our discrimination in things like the workplace, healthcare, school, and elsewhere. And these gender critical people and groups are often funded, supported, and uplifted by many right wing and alt right and quite often anti transgender and anti women's rights groups. For example, the anti LGBTQ group the Heritage Foundation in the United States platformed and worked with many members of the gender critical group the Women's Liberation Front of the WOLF in the US to oppose a transgender rights Supreme Court case. Similarly, gender critical groups also help to fund and platform the Bell v. Tavistock case in the United Kingdom, a case which effectively put a ban on gender affirming health care for transgender minors in the UK, and a case which was fought for by lawyer Paul Conrath, an anti abortion and anti gay lawyer with connections to the conservative hate group Alliance Defending Freedom. So basically, gender critical views are deeply transphobic in nature just based on what they're saying, but are also wielded and used to help fuel an anti-transgender hate campaign by both gender critical groups themselves, as well as conservative and far right groups who co-opt these gender critical groups in order to fuel a culture war campaign against trans people in order to win votes and gain talking space ground as well as obfuscate more important issues that conservatives don't want people to actually think about. They're basically just trying to go. Think of the horrible transes that are trying to hurt you and not how we are snake oil salesmen fundamentally failing at helping you. And hey look, we have gender critical people here, so called feminists, to say and try to justify that we aren't hurting women with our anti transgender nonsense. And don't idea, that idea of how anti transgender stuff also hurts women will be an idea that we'll be coming back to in just a moment. But even if we remove the political ramifications of gender critical groups, on just a singular and personal level, gender critical views can be deeply harmful to trans folks. You see, gender critical folks will typically just say that they're just arguing that, well, we just believe that sex is real, sex is biological and important, that's, that's all we're saying, we're just saying that, I mean it's basic science. And I mean, put in those terms, that seems reasonable enough to someone who's just looking in from the outside. That seems like something that should be self-evident. Evident? Evident. That seems like something that should be self-evident if I can speak. But first off, no transgender person argues that sex isn't real. Trans people are acutely aware of our sex and biology, let me tell you. Why do you think some of us wish to go on hormones and get surgeries? Because we aren't aware of our biology? Believe me, I get hormones specifically because I am well aware of my biology and how biology works. And I know that by getting hormones, it helps my mental health and personal and physical well-being, as well as helps me lead a happier and better life. It's not because I ignore biology, but because I'm acutely aware of my biology. But gender critical folks like Maya, as I said, argue that they're just feminists trying to point this out. And they do so by lying and misrepresenting and strawmanning trans people's beliefs and who we are. As I said, they do this on a political level, but personally, gender critical folks repeatedly denname misgender and insult transgender people in real life and online. Transgender people are one of the most harassed groups online, and TERFs make up a predominant part of people trying to push this harassing rhetoric. To give you a personal example, there are literally entire gender critical sites online where these gender critical feminists insult my looks, dead name, and misgender me, call me ugly, insult my hairline, and things like that. Not only is that patently wrong, I am adorable, but also, like, why would you, that, that, that feels like it's not feminist of you to like just insult any, regardless of whether you see me as a man or a woman, like to go online and insult someone's looks kind of feels like it goes against the whole idea of feminism. And while they do that to me because I am a public facing transgender person, they also do this to literally every single transgender person that they'll come across, going on Twitter to say things that were disfigured, that were mutilated, and much worse, that were delusional, that were mentally ill, that were disgusting. They use dehumanizing language to describe human beings trying to live our lives. Numerous studies show that transgender folks who are discriminated against with things like misgendering or deadnaming or just general harassment face higher rates of mental health issues, suicidality rates, and just feeling unsafe in a space. And this brings us back to Maya because Maya herself constantly attacked, deadnamed, and insulted transgender people both in her workplace and online publicly on Twitter, all while trying to protect herself under the veil that she was just saying biological sex is real, which again is an idea that no trans person is arguing against. 
Even Maya Forstarter herself stated in her own submission to the court, I reserve the right to use he him pronouns for male people. No one has the right to compel others to make statements they don't believe. Maya was also one of the signees of a gender critical document, Women's Health Care Rights Campaign Declaration, which calls for, quote, the elimination of transgenderism. The elimination of transgenderism. Hmm. That doesn't sound f***ing concerning at all. Don't you just love it when someone calls for the elimination of entire groups of people that physically exist? Like, I'm trans. I'm here. So to eliminate transgenderism means to eliminate me as a person. Think about that. And I mean, I know some of you hear that and say, Jesse, you're being overreactive. You could just argue that she just wants to eliminate the belief in gender ideology, a phrase which gender critical folks love to wield in defiance of science, reason, and just all around good graces against the transgender community. But even if that's your take on this, that it's just the gender ideology that these gender critical groups are going after, which it isn't, but whatever, let's just say it was, then don't you find it kind of funny that someone like Maya, who has fought so hard to defend her gender critical beliefs as protected speech in court, also thinks that gender ideology, which would be an another protected belief, by the way, should be eliminated? Seems a little bit hypocritical there, one would think. You see, and if you'll allow me this one brief aside, this is why I am of the belief that as ironic as it sounds, tolerance means that we cannot tolerate intolerance. Because by tolerating intolerance, we place marginalized groups, trans folks in this case, in the same space as those who are trying to harm us. And those intolerant groups will use everything they can to push and hurt marginalized groups, and then use the defense, well, you have to tolerate our views to protect themselves. And then once they've established that, those intolerant groups will use everything they can to try to push out and hurt marginalized groups like trans people. And then use the defense that, well, you have to tolerate our views because it's a protected speech in order to defend themselves as they continue to hurt a marginalized and vulnerable group. In order to protect those who are vulnerable, you cannot protect intolerance and hatefulness. It may sound hypocritical, and to a degree it is, I'll admit that, but nothing is ever always, and to be tolerant means we must be intolerant of intolerance. But again, that's my two cents here. But anyways, moving back to the subject at hand, basically everything that I'm talking about, the larger connotations of this, is one of the main reasons why this court case is so deeply concerning to trans people. But there are also a few things to think about with this ruling. First, while Maya's belief is protected, it does not give her the right to use them to harass trans people. As the Trades Union Congress stated about Maya's ruling, quote, employers have a responsibility to keep all their staff, including trans and non-binary workers, safe from discrimination and harassment. As the judgment has highlighted, this case does not change that. So while under this ruling, people like Maya have every right to hold their gender critical views, they don't get to wield them as harassment against trans people. Let me just give you a little fun example to illustrate what I'm talking about. We all know that Galaxy Quest wasn't assigned a Star Trek film at birth. And the only reason it's not officially considered a Star Trek film is because of annoying corporate and social rules that state that it doesn't have the legal right to be one because of how it was born. I mean, made. But we all know that it's a freaking great Trek film. And yeah, some people will say it's not really a Trek film and think it's awful and, and, and just bad. And they have every right to believe that. But that doesn't mean that they have the right to harass folks and attack folks who love Galaxy Quest with their Trek-phobic beliefs. Okay, sorry, got, got a little bit heated there. Obviously, this metaphor isn't perfect. I just kind of thought it was funny. All I'm trying to say with this metaphor, and if there's one thing you take away from this video, it will be this, is that trans people are essentially Galaxy Quest. By grab Thaw's hammer! But, you know, seriously, basically, Maya and gender critical feminists have the right to believe whatever they want. That belief may be, as the judge in Maya's ruling stated, profoundly offensive and even distressing to many others, but fine, have them if you will. But you don't get to harass others with those beliefs. You can have whatever horrific beliefs you want to have, but you don't get to wield them to attack trans people or other marginalized groups. But. On the bright side, for right now, this ruling does not give transphobes the right to be transphobic, at least publicly. And as a result, this ruling, as of this moment, doesn't have much teeth in terms of ramifications in a practical sense for trans people. And that's all really well and good. However, there are a few more concerns with this. The first is that this ruling will allow Maya to retry her case that she was discriminated against for her gender-critical views by her contract not being renewed. 
And if she wins that case because her views are now seen as a protected belief, it may serve as setting a larger precedent for wider discrimination to be allowed against trans people in things like job employment, uh, just the being in the workplace, healthcare, and other areas, under the auspices that it's just a protected belief to be transphobic. And to be fair, that's just within the United Kingdom. However, it may be easy for many of you who aren't trans folks living in the United Kingdom to be able to ignore this as a result. I would hope that you wouldn't because even if you don't live in the United Kingdom or even if you do live in the United Kingdom but aren't trans, you should still care about the rights of marginalized people. We should stand in solidarity and as allies to protect those who are vulnerable. But that being said, this is also still concerning beyond trans folks and beyond just the United Kingdom. First and foremost, as I said, a lot of these gender critical groups who are very, very powerful in the United Kingdom use these wins in the UK to help fuel and then inform their fights around the world against trans people. For example, after the anti-transgender affirming healthcare for trans teens Bell v. Tavistock case was won by anti-transgender groups in the United Kingdom, the WOLF, the gender critical group, began working to bring those same arguments against trans affirming healthcare to the United States. It's by no means a coincidence that very soon after that case was finished, we saw very similar anti-trans bills crop up in the United States with the help of these gender critical groups and their conservative friends like those in the Heritage Foundation and the Alliance Defending Freedom. Additionally, these gender critical groups pushing this rhetoric also attack not just trans people, but women's rights in general, wider LGBTQ rights, and the rights of other marginalized groups, and often use these attacks against trans peoples as proving grounds for other attacks. I mean, for example, the Heritage Foundation literally attacks women's reproductive health care laws, something you would think that gender critical groups who claim to be feminists would care about. But that just goes to reveal how much their gender critical movement isn't about helping women, just more about attacking trans folks. But even beyond that, we've seen how these transphobic arguments are then wielded to attack women's rights in general, not just trans women's rights, but all women's rights. For example, we've seen British transphobic journalist Kathleen Farrow argue that Maya's ruling also defends homophobic beliefs about marriage, as well as anti-abortion rhetoric. Gender critical views are often intrinsically linked with homophobia and misogyny as well as racism and anti-Semitism too, though that particular intersection will get its own video from me in the future, I promise. And there's some, you know, links down in the doobly-doo that get into that. But I at least wanted to mention it because it is kind of important. So, while Maya Forstarter's latest win in court is not the grand sweeping victory that many gender critical folks argue that it is, it still certainly sets the ground for many scary and concerning implications for many of us, but especially and most directly for trans folks living in the United Kingdom today. However, to wrap out this video, I want to end on something hopeful. Because while gender critical groups are certainly celebrating their transphobic victories, and it's important to remember that they are dogmatic and vocal, it's also important to notice that they are a minority. As a recent survey in the United Kingdom found, most people, and especially women, agree that trans people are who we say we are, that trans women are women, for example, and also that 70% of people believe that transgender people face discrimination. Yes, there are still things to fight in the court of public opinion, such as the idea that trans people deserve to be in sports, but also, on the whole, people want to be affirming to trans people, who want to try and understand and get to know trans people and the fights that we face, and to at least some degree know that trans people are under attack. It's not to the levels that we need them to understand, and we need more allies to stand up and fight alongside us because we are under attack, under direct attack. But I want people to never forget that the majority of people are good, are kind, and are caring. It's easy to get depressed and down today about trans issues. It seems like we're being attacked from every single angle, and it seems like there's no good news in sight. Believe me, I understand that. I struggle with those same feelings as well. But while trans folks often are forced to fight back because we are given no other choice, and we need allies to help us, it's important to remember that we can and will win. Because the majority of people are good. And I truly believe that if we fight for goodness and for kindness and for caring, others will recognize that. And in the end, we will always win because we are fighting alongside others who care. And so, to quote a great work of transgender fiction, never give up, never surrender.
Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Um, I just wanted to talk about and explain this case because I feel like, especially in the mainstream and especially in the United States, a lot of people don't understand this case and what it means for trans people, as well as the fact that this case is setting a precedent for not only things in the United Kingdom, but also for future attacks in the United States, because we've seen a direct link between attacks in the UK against trans people and then those being exported over here to the United States into other areas around the world. So I really want to draw attention to this case because I think it's something that we need to be aware of, of how to talk back against and how to fight back against in terms of fighting for trans people. Um, so I just at least wanted to draw attention to it because this might be the first in uh, a much larger discussion around these issues around gender critical feminists. I mean, we've already had to discuss gender critical feminists a lot lately, um, and that's definitely not going to go away anytime soon, sadly. So I at least wanted to uh, continue the conversation with some specificity instead of just general philosophy that I've done on this channel sometimes, which is also important, but uh, it's also important to talk about specifics as well when it comes to gender critical feminists. So thank you so much for watching this. I hope it was helpful. I hope you enjoyed uh, as best <laughs> as best I could. Don't forget, trans people are Galaxy Quest. That's the most important thing to remember. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this channel for more discussions on trans topics, about geekdom and pop culture. That's also stuff I do on this channel uh, as well. Um, I also have a Patreon where you can help support me doing what I do. It helps me pay the bills. This is my full-time job, so Patreon literally uh, feeds me and helps me be able to pay the rent and all of that. Um, but beyond all of that, I just uh, thank you so much for stopping by. I hope you enjoyed your time as best you could with a topic like this, and I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. It's time for Pride Month and time to celebrate my Patreons. Catherine Lambeth, Miranda Janelle, Ashley Allen, Bo Kiki, Yo, Eli Bergmoss, Morgan the Pirate Queen, Ashlyn Solstice, Greg Gillum, James Elizabeth, Stephen Kleinard, Randy Thompson, Barbara Ruski, Samuel Howard, Felicia Toast, Alex, Boy to Mary Beth, Earl Wellington Marcus, Stephen Schuhart, Kate Mikitine, Bush, April Struck, Base, A Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Corian Bale Honkinen, James Cribda, Ish the Mad, Dominic Noble, Buttoneer, Jessica Wright, Jared Johnson, Peter Landers, Ferengito, John Steele, Carmen Olsen, Meadow Whisperer, William Stewart, Maggie the Goblin, Ulysses the Pagan, Melinda Walters, Joy A, Alex Owen, Barbara Halechuk, Heuresis, The Auth 13, Jason Knott, John Weatherby, Celestial Dawn, Lamia, Sky Skinner, Andrew K, Maeve, Nathan Steele, Sean Piper, Tiffany Danger, Flynn, Troy Stull, Sky Do Dodo, Amanda Comet, Ava Canivia, Geek Filter, Janie Peckard, Polymena Din, Laura Demero, Marina Carr, Gretchen Badger, Ellie O'Dare, Sarah Bystam, W. Randy E.D., Jacob Tovar, Strawberry Pop Tart, Keith Briggs, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Lysa, Mountain Harpy, Jessica Chapman, Andrew Lamoro, Sarah Sweeney, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Emily Loomis, Mari Mack, Zone One Librarian, Ver, Jenny Mabel, Michael Hardy, Pasty, Michael Goaty, Philip Hawkins, Andy H. You're the best. I love all of you. You're freaking amazing. Thank you so much for making this possible. Happy Pride, everybody.